Oh, thank you for, yeah, they had me put the mic in here, here. This was supposed to be starting at seven o'clock, which means I should probably be starting right now where I could just be talking to myself for the occasion of that itself. But first, should we start? Are there any rebuttals yet? Uh. Questions, comments, <laughs> ideas, or whatever here? Because the very fact that you are down here shows that this is indeed a miracle. <laughs> because where we are right now is on a place called the Miracle Mile. South Broadway was originally an elite residential street. This was the place across Cherry Creek. And of course, the other side of Cherry Creek was evil, wicked Denver. And anybody that could get out of evil, wicked Denver would do so along the way out of it. And soon you start having some fantastic mansions going up south of Cherry Creek, along Broadway, east of Broadway, west of Broadway. A lot of them still survive today in something called the Baker Neighborhood itself on that itself. And for about a generation, being on South Broadway was just this address that showed you were somebody very special, very prestigious. Beginning in the early 20th century, other neighborhoods, Capitol Hill, the Country Club, Park Hill, all start emerging and sort of land up going and putting uh, South Broadway into the shade out of that there. And as the longtime owners of the mansions on South Broadway land up dying off, they land up tearing down the houses, and soon they're starting to put up very simple storefronts. And before long, the stores are getting a little fancier and a little more elite of this, and suddenly, after the end of World War I in the 1920s, Broadway to the south of Cherry Creek is considered Denver's Miracle Mile. And the term Miracle Mile is among the buzzwords of the 1920s. Back before World War I, there was a guy named J.W. Wilshire out in Los Angeles. And old man Wilshire was a perfect crank quack, sort of the model of California kooks and cranks along the way. And Wilshire always had a new program, a new scheme, a new idea. On the one hand, he is a super capitalist. On the other hand, he is financing a fairly influential socialist newspaper out of it. And he is saying that the whole geography of Los Angeles needed to be totally transformed because Los Angeles is the city of the future. And the way people were going to get around the city of the future was in automobiles. And rather than going to downtown with all the traffic and congestion, they would want to go shopping out on this elite, prestigious boulevard on what was then seemingly the outskirts of Los Angeles, Wilshire Boulevard. And for years it flopped, it's a joke, it's a laughing stock. And suddenly after World War I, Wilshire Boulevard blossoms as the most prestigious automobile oriented strip in the country. Movie theaters, miniature golf courses, fancy car dealerships, distinctive boutiques itself. And it's a miracle. It's a miracle that the mile of Wilshire Boulevard developed the way that old man Wilshire said it was going to. And that's where the term miracle mile lands up coming up. And soon any city that is pretentious decides it needs to have its miracle mile along the way. And so basically South Broadway declares we are Denver's miracle mile, basically from about Cherry Creek over to the railroad tracks near about where Interstate 25 crosses Broadway, or maybe it wasn't even that far to the south. Maybe it was over at Merchants Park. And Merchants Park was another of the typical developments that was going on a South Broadway in the course of the 1920s. 
Merchants Park was on the west side of Broadway, off to the northwest of the Exposition Avenue, 700 blocks, uh, 700 blocks, seven blocks to the west of the First Avenue there. And originally the Merchants Baking Company, which was a major, major producer of cookies, snacks, crackers, that later becomes something called the Bowman Biscuit Company, that later becomes part of Nabisco, where some other national chain was going to go and build its super fancy bakery there. And at one time, the Bowman Biscuit Company just had these amazing links along the way. Clinton Bowman, the head of the company, is politically very well involved. At one time, he is the wealthiest man in Colorado in terms of income, according to the IRS. At another time, he teams up with the Jewish community of Denver. And this is the situation when he convinces a leading Orthodox synagogue, the BMH, which as you all know stands for the Big Money Honcho Synagogue of Denver. <laughs> Or, or maybe it stands for the Beth HaMidrash Hagadol, the big house of prayer of this, that the way they are going to raise money for their Hebrew school is by having the students in the Hebrew school go out and sell cookies that will be specially baked by the Bowman Biscuit Company. And these are the most delicious cookies around. The students are selling them right and left. They're consuming them right and left. And amidst all of this, right in the middle of the cookie drive, somebody that doesn't like the rabbi at the BMH does what is called a kashrut review of Bowman Biscuit Company cookies of this, and he finds out that they are using animal fats, probably lard, to bake these kosher cookies of the BMH on that. Well, this was sort of typical of the tradition of the yeah, Merchants Baking Company, Bowman Biscuit Company, because he gets a hold of this land in the early 1920s, but before he can go and build anything there, the Denver Bears awake from hibernation. The Denver Bears was the city's longtime minor league baseball team. And over the decades, the Bears would play, the team would collapse, it would be reorganized, collapse again out of that itself. But suddenly, in the spring of 1922, the Denver Bears come back to life and they can't reach an agreement with the landlord of the existing local baseball stadium, which was over at 6th Avenue and Broadway. So they work out a deal with the Merchants Baking Company where they will build a baseball stadium rather than a bakery off of Exposition and Broadway there. And they land up going and building the new ballpark in the course of six weeks. And the Merchants Park always seems to look that way of a very hasty job. All it has is a bunch of bleachers around up there. It has extremely primitive plumbing facilities, complete with almost open gutters in terms of the urinals, and the yeah, restrooms are right under the, yes, grandstands along the first and third baselines to send up enhancing odors in the middle of the yeah, summer. And more than that, they have home base at Merchants Park off near the southeast corner of the field. And you never want to have home plate at the southeast corner of a field because what happens, here you're having the game, it's about 5 p.m., 6 p.m., the batter is getting up there, up that, and he's looking directly to the west, smack with the sun in his face out of that. So Merchants Park becomes among the very first baseball fields in the country to have lighting for night games. 
but it has such poor illumination for the games out of this is often the people in the infield can't see what's going on in the outfield and the outfielders often have no idea where the ball is coming from but it is great advantage to the home team because what happens on terms of all of this is that the fielders for the home team would always take an extra baseball or two with them in their pockets when they hit the field on this and suddenly there would be this long fly ball nobody could tell where the fly ball is going the batter thinks he got a really good hit he's rounding first base and right about the time he's pulling into second out of nowhere there's the ball and he's out where the outfielder just pulled out an extra baseball <laughs> along the way out of that there. And again, typical of what happens with Merchants Park on this, the Denver Bears soon go into hibernation again. They make it into a miniature car racetrack at one time. And then this is the situation in 1947 when the Denver Bears again awake from hibernation after World War II. And Denver, as ever, is a juvenile city at this time, where it's baseball, 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 baseball. Look at, we got baseball of this. And so they're celebrating the rebirth of the Denver Bears. And on opening day, anybody that is anybody is out at Bears uh, Merchants Park to do that. And the mayor of Denver at this time is the 77-year-old Ben Stapleton. He's facing a tough re-election challenge that year. And to show his virality, he announces he's not going to throw out the first pitch. He is going to hit the first pitch. And meanwhile, the father-in-law of the owner of the Denver Bears, Bob Hausman is the owner, his father-in-law is Ed Johnson, who is United States Senator from Colorado. And Senator Johnson finds out that there is a young Republican congressman who's going to be passing through Denver that day of this. So he arranges for this young Republican congressman to throw out the first pitch for Mayor Stapleton to hit. And the California congressman winds up and he throws his curveball and Mayor Stapleton swings mightily at it and he falls flat on his back being struck out by a guy named Tricky Dicky Nixon from California who's just coming on the scene. Well, meanwhile, there's a Denver Post photographer there, and he snaps this great, great picture of Mayor Stapleton striking out, and he rushes it back to the city room, and the editor looks at me and says, sorry, we can't use this. It's going to make people feel sorry for Mayor Stapleton, and we want to defeat him for re-election. So the photographer sells the picture to Life magazine. So if you wanted to know what was happening out at Merchants Park, you had to read Life magazine rather than the Denver Pest, or is it the Denver Post? I never can quite remember <laughs> on those things there. Well, soon thereafter, the Denver Bears decide that they belong in a garbage dump, a trash heap, instead of a baseball field. And in 1948, they open up something called Bears Stadium along West 17th Avenue between about Bryant and Decatur Streets on a natural hill. And before the Denver Bears got a hold of that property, that had been a trash dump, and the city basically offered the land real cheap to the Denver Bears if they would clean it up. And the idea of building a baseball park on a hill was that we will make this a natural amphitheater where we'll put the seats right on the hill to look down on the playing field. And in fact, Burnham Hoyt, who is the architect of the Red Rocks architect, Amphitheater is the architect of Bears Stadium along the way, and they tear down the old Merchants Park on South Broadway and turn that into among the very first shopping centers of Denver about 1948, 1949. And it was typical of the neighborhood, a modest middle-class shopping center, a grocery store, a bowling alley, a five and 10 store, all combined out of that there, and this goes on till the 1980s. 
And by the 1980s, Denver is ashamed of itself. Anything that is in Denver is no good. It's obsolete. It's run down of this. And you especially hear this from City Hall and the business establishment. It's no good to have a Denver Dry Goods, a regionally renowned department store. It's no good to have the May DNF, a place that actually starts up in Leadville in the 1870s. We have to have a Saks Fifth Avenue. We have to have a Lords and Taylor. We have to have the, a Macy's or something else on that itself. And amidst all of this, a guy named Alan Reaver comes on the scene. And Alan Reaver is among the voodoo artists that Denver has specialized in over the years of this. He's a failed lawyer, a failed architect from Houston, from Baltimore, who lands up in Denver in the early 1970s, and he soon realizes that Denver is a city of fools. And towards this end, he sees why is Denver tearing down all of these beautiful, old brick and stone buildings around town. These are marvels of Victorian architecture and design of this. They can be renovated and create something of a very, very distinctive old town in Denver. And that in some ways is the origins of lower downtown. And he has an excellent sense of design of using antiques. Now, the way Alan Reaver gets his antiques is quite interesting as well. He has his business supply truck, and he prowls around neighborhoods, and he sees if a Victorian house is vacant, and suddenly, about 3 a.m., Alan Reaver and his crew will hit a vacant Victorian house and make off with the stained glass, the fixtures, the chandeliers, the fireplace mantles out of it. And he's renowned as a crook in all of this, but he lands up making ties with a guy named Robert Anderson. Anderson, who is the head of the Atlantic Richfield Corporation. And uh, Anderson is reaching his age of retirement, and he is convinced by Reaver to invest in Denver. And they're going to have a total brand new Denver that's going to be along Interstate 25 that's going to stretch from about where Confluence Park is down near 15th Street and the Platte River all along I-25 over where the crowning gem of everything is going to be the Old Merchants Park Shopping Center. And on this basis, Alan Reaver gets this and he gets the nearby Monkey Wards building as well. Now, Monkey Wards is a local regionalism about all of this for Montgomery Wards. And what happens is, in the mid-1920s, Montgomery Wards, which at one time was something of the Amazon of the day, a mail order operation that has selling to three quarters of the population in the country through catalogs, a big rival of Sears along the way, decides that it is going to expand into retail sales and it gets a hold of the property directly adjacent to Merchants Park off at the southwest corner of Virginia Avenue and South Broadway where it puts up a nine-story building that's a department store, a dining spot, a lumber yard, a car dealership, but something like five, six offices of warehouse space serving a quarter of the United States of this. And can we have a place like Monkey Wards, as locals always call that there? It sells to the plebeians. It sells to a third world audience. We need to totally transform this into the most glittering spot of all. So Denver basically tells Montgomery Wards, go get out of here. Good. It's glad that you're on the verge of bankruptcy. The sooner you fail, but better on that. And amidst all of this, Alan Reaver decides he's going to have on the ninth story penthouse of the Monkey Ward building this command office out of Star Wars. It is 
filled with science fiction material. He has knights and armors as his goons up there. He also is a big motorcycle collector of vintage Harleys are throughout the place out of that. And meanwhile, he is transforming the old Merchants Park Shopping Center into something called the Denver Design Center. And if you need to know what a design center is, you are an obvious ignoramus who is unworthy of being informed about as much. And that was the tone of Denver in the 1980s when Denver was going to become the design center of the world. And design centers are quite the vogue and nobody at City Hall, the business community, or the business press is ever able to tell anybody what a design center is. And basically what a design center was, this was going to be the place for especially interior decorators, clothing designers, furniture designers, mostly selling in a wholesale market of supposedly a creative class, and towards this end, Alan Reaver lands up commissioning a world-renowned artist, Herbert Bayer, to go and build about a 15-story high yellow monolith right behind the Denver Design Center to catch the eye of motorists on I-25. And sort of what is typical of this is by this time, Herbert Bayer is about 85 years old, a refugee of Hitler, and that was his last piece. And he's never paid for it. His widow is never paid for it, but that's partly how Alan Reefer makes his money. He never pays anybody for anything of this. Instead, he is heavily going and borrowing from savings and loans. But he announces, okay, you Cherry Creek, you can have a plebeian place like Neiman Marcus or Saks Fifth Avenue. I'm going to have Pretons. And Protons is this premier Paris department store where South Broadway is going to be the equivalent of Rodeo Drive or Fifth Avenue in New York of this itself. And again, Alan Reaver is a good creative architect of this, and he puts in bridges and does actually quite a nice design of that. The problem is nobody ever buys anything at Protons and it doesn't really have much of a stock. The whole thing is a shell. It's a false front, so to speak, for Alan Reaver, other schemes out of all of these things there. And meanwhile, Alan Reaver likes dealing with the nightlife of Denver. And what he means by dealing with the nightlife of Denver is he goes around in his limousine with his goons, bodyguards, and he has a little paddle with him of this. And he has taken the paddle and he has driven nails into the paddle of this. So just the points of the nails are sticking out at the other end of this. And he's a street brawler and he deliberately is getting into fight with street people, beggars, other things like that. And he takes out his paddle and he will slap them, viciously wound them in the process out of these things there. And meanwhile, women come and go from his life until everything starts collapsing and one of his girlfriends starts complaining that he is extremely brutal of this itself and sexually assaults her, but good, and tries to bite off her clitoris as part of these activities. And right about this time, $80 million of loans of Alan Reaver are coming due to a Pennsylvania-based savings and loan. And he says, sorry, I can't pay you. You want to foreclose on me? You know what's going to happen if you try to foreclose on me? You're going to go flat broke of this because you put too many eggs in my basket of this. What you need to do is give me another $10 million to keep on going. And they give him that money <laughs> out of that. And then at least... Unfortunately, we have the great late departed George Bush on the scene 
who had a brilliant son that was a collaborator in all of this, Neil Bush, who was uh, on the board of a local thoroughly corrupt savings and loan, Silverado Savings, out of this. And suddenly, right about the time that the late lamented, poor, perfect George Bush <laughs> comes to and, and the whole savings and loan economy totally collapses on this, whereupon the yeah, Alan Reaver empire totally collapses and he flees to New York. In New York, he presents himself as this brilliant young Denver architect and developer who is redeveloping parts of an old industrial district to the south of Houston Street, the Soho neighborhood in New York out of this on his model of Denver. And about this time, his former girlfriend files a complaint against him of sexual assault of that itself. And he says, oh, I'm really sorry about all of this. I'll tell you what I'll do. If you will accept a donation of $10,000, I will give you $10,000 for an anti-violence against woman fund out of these things. And somehow the prosecutors weren't quite ready to go along with this. They bring him back out to Denver. They say, you've been a nasty boy. Why don't you go back to New York and never hear of a, uh, you doing something like this again in town? And as far as I know, Alan Reaver is still functioning as this brilliant uh, sleazeball developer in New York City where he seems to be right at home, finally, of that. Well, meanwhile, now you have a vacant monkey wards, you have a vacant merchant's park, uh, this. So a group called Dura comes on the scene. And Dura stands for destroying urban retail areas. Uh, I, I mean, it's the Denver Urban Renewal Authority. <laughs> but anyway, what Dura lands up doing is it basically gets all of the failed Alan Reaver projects and it decides we need retail on South Broadway. And the way we're going to get retail on South Broadway is we're going to blow up the Monkey Wards building. So on something like Valentine's Day 1992, 1993, they blow up the building on national television out of this. And then the Denver Urban Renewal Authority pays Kmart and Sam's Club and Albertson and others to come in and open a new shopping center over at Alameda and Broadway along the way. And now they're saying Kmart closed a year or so ago. We need to tear all of the retail down here. This is too elite a housing development section of this. So you think miracles have only started to begin out of that. But typical of what was happening on this section of the Miracle Mile back in the 1920s is this building right here. And this opens up originally as one of many many small grocery stores around here. Probably between about 6th Avenue and Alameda, there would be a dozen grocery stores, another dozen uh, soda fountain drug stores at one time or another. And eventually this place becomes an outlet of something called Republic Drug. And Republic Drug was like Rexall drugs, like Walgreens, like Rite Aid, of this part of originally a national pharmaceutical chain that would be around about here. Of that. So it's this gathering, meeting spot, whatever on that itself. And then by the early 1980s, the old fashioned independent pharmacy is just collapsing every place. And as far as I know, there are no well, more Republic drugstores any place around the country, much less Denver on all of this. And the area by this time is getting rather depressed. And again, illustrative of this is a block down from here is a place called the Hornet, a nice restaurant on that itself. For many years, that was something called Williams Men's Store. And Williams Men's Store was a very prestigious, top-class haberdashery of this. They had nearby another elite 
haberdashery, especially if you wanted to go to a funeral. And today, that was the old Fleming Brothers building just to the south of there, a three-story stone building that at one time included a mortuary on the premises, and another time included something called Denver Formal Wear, which was this place where you could go and get a super fancy tuxedo, so you're going to the wedding or something like that itself on that. But that was typical. There was also a lot of department stores around here. There wasn't just Montgomery Wards branches of a lot of the downtown department stores, Joslin's, the May Company, Penny's, all have outlets on this. In fact, across the street from here, where you have the Goodwill store was, again, sort of typical of the evolution of that. That store originally goes up as something called Three Rules in the early 20th century. And the guy that has the three rules here has three amazing rules, which is one price for everybody. Because until that time, the way you would buy something at a department store is you had to be prepared to dicker in one form or another, and the clerk would negotiate the price of this. A good item that was returnable, i.e. it's not what is called a schlock shop out of this where they are selling utter junk for supposedly good prices out of it and a fair profit. And when the longtime owner of Three Rules lands up dying in the 1930s, Penny's gets a hold of that as its local outlet. And for years, if you wanted to go shopping but did not want to go downtown, you would come over to the Miracle Mile for the occasion. And again, places like Williams are on the high end of this. Well, then the city decides it needs to improve Broadway. And this is the situation in 1965 when the city announces that the demand for traffic to serve the suburbs is much greater than the capacity that Broadway has to handle because this is right about the time that the interstate highway system is at full blast. Interstate 25 is evolving, being from the Valley Highway. And us old fogies will often sometimes on occasion talk about the Valley Highway. That was the original name of Interstate 25. It was to be in the Platte River Valley of that. Well, anyway, amidst all of that, to get more people from downtown out to the Valley Highway in 1965, the city announces that it is going to transform Broadway into a one-way street southbound while it's going to go and transform Lincoln Street into a one-way street northbound from the freeway into the central business district out of that. And that is a devastating blow to Broadway. Suddenly the traffic is twice as heavy on Broadway as it used to be, but the motorists are so intent on watching traffic and getting to the freeway and getting out of the area, nobody is stopping at the shops on Broadway anymore. And there is this massive wave of failures. Besides, who wants to go to the Miracle Mile when you can be going out to the suburban shopping centers instead. And so within the course of 10 years, there is just massive vacancies around here. And from going and being a prestigious store, suddenly the Williams Men's Store at First and Broadway is vacant. And for a while, it's a thrift store. There's Goodwill in there for a while. There's a couple other thrift stores in the place. And then there's a restaurant that comes in on the scene that was really sort of apropos for the neighborhood. It's a place I still miss called Mary and Lou's. And in this case, Mary and Lou Poboyski are a couple that had met working at a Walgreens in central Chicago. In fact, Ground Zero, the number one Walgreens store in the country out of it. And somehow they drift out here and they decide they're going to have this 24 hour a day diner over there. And they decorate it with this amazing sense of wry humor, 
combined with memorabilia, where it's almost this museum piece, and again, sort of typical of what they have, is they have a whiskey glass with a bullet in it, which is a shot glass for them itself. And they're joking about Polish jokes, other details, and you never know what you are going to find in Mary and Lou. Sometimes great service, sometimes, huh? What? And usually the later it is, the more colorful it is. This is sometimes where the coffee, you have people that are waiting for somebody at Denver General in the middle of the night that can't handle the hospital, go for a break. This is a place where sometimes a homeless person who has enough money for a cup of coffee goes in to try to kill two, three, four hours along the way of that. And along the way, what I remember best about Mary and Lou's is they had these huge cinnamon rolls. And a Mary and Lou's cinnamon roll was the size of a dinner dish of that. And when I was working down as a journalist around here, among other things, that was often would be my after job meal, so to speak, out of it when I wanted to go low scale. The high scale of this was a place called the 404 Club. <laughs> and the 404 Club was again somewhat indicative of the area. That was, believe it or not, at 404 Broadway. I know you know some of you would <laughs> never have guessed that one. <laughs> And a guy named Jerry Felt opens that on his 21st birthday, about 1953. He's from an old liquor store family. He had an uncle in the nightclub business, and he had just graduated from the University of Denver, was on the verge of graduation, and he decided that rather than going to law school and practicing at the bar, he decided he would run the bar instead out of that there. And it was a total, complete dump in there. Absolutely drab inside, other than Bronco posters. And he was always very proud of his Bronco posters because he claimed that in 1961, the second year that the Broncos ever played, he was the first bar owner in town to come up with the idea of a Bronco bus, a Bronco brunch, whatever, in terms of all of that. They are of this, but his specialty of the house for years was the $5 steak dinner. And last time I ate there before he got real sick, the $5 steak dinner was up to $15, and the staff was all changing or whatever, and he died maybe about six, seven, eight years ago or so, and the replacement places just are not the same out of it itself. But again, you're having this transition, this churn, that is going on Broadway at this time. And added to all of this is the rise of something called the Baker neighborhood. And what lands up happening here is there never was a really distinctive real estate name to this area other than Miracle Mile. At one time, it was called Broadway Terrace, east of Broadway was East Broadway Terrace. They were very creative in names back here on all of that itself on that there. And then in 1972, the city decides it's going to completely carve up the city into something called statistical planning units at the behest of the Model Cities Act of Washington. And the poorer a neighborhood was, the more money it qualified to receive from Washington in the name of model cities and urban renewal of this itself. So the planners that knew nothing about this area decide that the area south of 6th Avenue all the way to Mississippi Avenue from the Platte River to Broadway was going to be the Baker neighborhood. And there were bakers in the area, but that wasn't for whom they were naming it. James H. Baker was a longtime principal of East High School who later goes on to be president of the University of Colorado, and he dies in the mid-1920s, right when a new West High School is opening up at West 9th Avenue and Alati Street. And when the new West High School opens up, they transformed the old West High School, which was at Fifth Avenue and Fox Street, 
into a new junior high school named for James H. Baker. They built a new Baker Junior High School there in the mid-1950s, but that was the only institution that the planners could figure out that sort of represented the neighborhood, so that's where the name Baker Neighborhood came out. Meanwhile, by this time, a lot of the old mansions in the area are in transition. They are seen their day as single-family houses. They had long been carved up into apartments, but it was still a proud middle-class dwellers in the place until our good old friends Dora comes on the scene. And among the great achievements, or maybe biggest disasters ever of Denver in the mid-1960s was something called the Skyline Urban Renewal Project. And this basically saw the total destruction of old Larimer Street from 15th Street to 20th Street in the name of destroying the pawn shops, the shelters, the porno joints, the simple lodges of that to transform the area into a place of the elite up there. Well, you do not destroy slums. What urban renewal does is slum relocation along the way out of that there and some of the marginal businesses from Larimer Street are starting to see where are the rents real cheap on South Broadway where city plans had kicked out all the merchants around there and so some of the porno joints are moving in the liquor stores are moving in there's a lot of complaints by the neighborhood but basically city hall doesn't care a lot of them are soon moving out soon there is one group that really does care and cares a lot about trying to revive the baker neighborhood and that is members of the gay community and the mid 1970s is right when homosexuals, whatever you want to call them, gays, lesbians, trans, whatever on this, are slowly starting to come out of the closet. And other than for their sexual orientation, a lot of the guys in particular are very insistent on their middle class orientation, that they are responsible, meaning homeowners. In fact, there was a place called the Jefferson Hotel, which was something like 440 South, the Broadway. That became the headquarters of the gay publishing empire of Denver in the 1980s into the 1990s. A guy named Bob Schloss had it, who, other than his sexual orientation, could have been your most staunch, conservative, Wall Street Republican you ever wanted to meet on these things. But what is happening is a lot of the guys are banding together and they see these old mansions on the Baker neighborhood and they start buying them. And they're putting in a lot of elbow sweat into the occasion. So are a lot of heterosexual couples, but there's a big difference of what happens next. The heterosexual couples soon have children. And this is right at the time that school busing is going on in town where the United States District Court is saying, you are going to have busing. We don't care whether it's causing chaos, whether it is helping education of the slightest. We are going to have busing in town of this. And usually when their children are starting to come of school age, the heterosexual couples are moving elsewhere so their children escape busing out of this. The gays at this time don't have to worry about that, and they're fixing up the area of the houses. Soon there's a lot of gay-oriented businesses, especially along parts of South Broadway, about here itself. Typical was a place that today I think, I'm not even sure what it is, it so changes uh, places, the Southtown Lumberyard, which was at the southwest corner of Byers Place and South Broadway that used to be a lumber yard many, many years ago. And that becomes a place called Southtown among the first open gay bars in the area itself. And among the people that eventually gets that through many, many different incarnations is the son of Wellington Webb when he is mayor. 
And in good traditions of whatever happens with the Webb City Hall is do you need to pay taxes if your father is the mayor? And members of the Department of Revenue, the Department of Liquor Licenses, figure everybody should pay the appropriate taxes. And when the mayor refuses to say that, okay, guess where we're going to visit the newspapers on this. And suddenly different owners come and have the south town of that itself. So you have this mixture. And again, typical also of what's going on, partly as a change of the 1970s into the 1980s is the legacy of the two movie houses that land up surviving out of a dozen or so along the Miracle Mile. One is close to this, the Mayan Theater. And that's among the ways you tell whether somebody is an old Denver person or not. The newcomers think it's the Mayan Theater. It is the Mayan Theater <laughs> out of that itself. It could be named for the Maya Indians, but it is the Mayan Theater in Denver pronunciation. They have all sorts of little uh, localisms of this. Like you go down to New Mexico, there is the Acoma Indian tribe that is a Pueblo tribe. Ask somebody where Acoma Street is, here is, huh? It's a Coma Street locally or whatever on that itself. Of that. But anyway, the Mayan, when it lands up opening about 1930 or so, was going to be this ultimate movie palace. The idea that you are going to the cinema not simply to see a film, you are going there for luxury for adventure. You are to be the king or the queen of the evening. And they would have very, very exotic designs in a lot of movie theaters. And in this case, it's uh, Mexican, Central American Indians of this. There was another place over North Denver, the Egyptian theater with a pyramid theme. There was a place on the uh, Ray Street in Colfax, the Aladdin Theater that was designed to look like it was out of Aladdin's magic lamp, on and on like that. But even so, the Mayan never really is a first-run theater. For years, it lands up being a second-run house, and this is the place that if you want to save 25 cents, and can wait for two, three weeks. The film that will cost you 50 cents to see during its premiere downtown a month later is at the Mayan for 25 cents or so out of the there. And this goes on slowly into the 1980s. And in the 1980s, actually even the 70s of this, the Mayan lands up becoming a buck flick. And a buck flick is where you could go and see a double feature for a buck. And the quality of the films at the Mayan was very, very uneven. It would be everything from Rambo versus King Kong along the way to the Academy Award winner of five years earlier. And if you were like me, or if like it, this is how I land up at the Mayan of this, is I've never been the greatest movie person around. And if there was really some hit that was out there that really appealed to me, that I decided maybe I should see this after all. I think about it, wait on it. By the time I finally have arranged a date and other things for all of this on there is nobody's showing it anymore. And you had to wait for a revival house or some other place to go show it itself. And then when you start getting the VCRs and the video stores in the 1980s, now people are renting their films on that and viewing them at home. And the attendance at the Mayan thoroughly collapses. And meanwhile, the banksters come on the scene. And in this case, for years, there has been a bank off at the northeast corner of First Avenue and Broadway. And the bankers behind that decide, why do we need a movie theater here? Instead of having a movie theater here, we can go and gut the place and turn it into a fancy shopping arcade called the Shops at the Mayan. 
of this, and they are all set to totally wreck the Mayan theater until a citizens group that is just absolutely sick of the vandalism, the destruction of existing movie houses around town, other places called the Friends of the Mayan, led by a great woman, Chris Citron, launches war on the owners of the bank, other such things on that. And amidst all of this, the Denver Broncos get involved. And what happens at this time is Patrick Boland, then the owner of the Denver Broncos, has get, been getting some very, very bad press. He's done a couple of things that have severe problems with City Hall, and he works out a deal which says he will buy the bank, the Mayan Theater, and the adjacent vacant lot, which is where the Walgreens is today, of that you know, to save the place. And of course, he will get rid of the bad press, he will get rid of the other problems out of that. So that's how they land up saving the Mayan and reopening it as a three-screen theater in 1986. Not nearly as successful was the rival to the Mayan for many years, the Weber Theater. And the Weber Theater was on the west side of Broadway between about Archer and the Cedar, Maple, whatever. It's a just have rebuilt the building in the last year or so as a whiskey distillery of that itself. And DeWitt Clinton Weber is a lawyer who is a very successful lawyer. And part of the reason that he's a very successful lawyer is he's a showman. And he's always acting before the jury and coming up with stunts. And eventually he decides he really wants to be a showman rather than an attorney of this. And he sees that the Weber Theater is built around the time of World War I in what is called the Cubist style of the day, where there are all sorts of glass cubes, crystals, dominating the routine out of it. A very, very ornate elite place that sometimes would host national film openings, premiere events into the 1960s. By this time, your second-run theaters every place are starting to be destroyed by suburban multiplexes of that. And amidst all of this, something called Kitties comes on the scene. And Kitties was a Colfax porno house, and it lands up going and getting a hold of the Weber Theater and redesigns the marquee of the Weber Theater so it has sort of a suggestively wagging Kitty's tail on the marquee out of it as a full service porno operation uh, there. And typical of the way a lot of people were outraged by this was right across the street from there was a place called National City Bank. And National City Bank that they've just demolished, they're doing construction on these days over at, again, I want to say Maple street of that itself used to have a special slogan called keep your kitty at national city <laughs> and it had a special program for youthful savers and if a youthful saver went to national city to open an account they wouldn't give him a piggy bank they would give him a kitty bank instead out of it itself on there of that and amidst all of these activities soon people are confusing the kitty bank with kitties along the way out of it itself on that itself and other porno joints are opening of the period and meanwhile the owners of the old Weber theater kitties don't care they just got the place inside out of it about 10 years ago, there was just a devastating fire in the interior. That was the end of Kitties. And basically the building was nothing more than a total shell until about two, three years ago when the distillery starts work on it. And according to the owners, there was nothing worth saving there. And he even got rid of the old Weber theater sign that used to be in the tiles right at the door 
of that itself. But of course, since you're in a bookstore, you all realize it's the book dealers that have caused all the problems around here, <laughs> especially the hipster book dealers. <laughs> and where we are right now is the ground zero of the hipster book dealers of Denver. And in particular, the pioneer hipster book dealer of Denver is Bill Good. He's about 95 years old these days, and back in the late 40s, early 50s, he indeed was the hipster out of this, a race car driver, a cab driver, a gambler, a hustler of many different names, many different careers, many different encounters with the authorities over the years that managed to keep surviving of this and somehow, in the course of the 1960s, he gets into the used book business. And at one time, he had something that could properly be called Avalanche Books, up at, by the Fred Rosenstock building at Colfax and Lafayette. He actually had a great, great stock of books on the premises right there, but he never would sort them out of this itself. And it's the kind of thing you'd go in and a book would look interesting and you might set off an avalanche trying to get to the book because there were just piles of routines every place out of it. And somehow he made a go of this as the most chaotic bookstore you could imagine in town. He sells that out, he gets involved in other schemes, over the years out of that and he has another bookstore up near the Bluebird Theater in the mid late 1980s of this itself and he gets into a dispute with the landlord because he sort of likes the courts and over the years he has sued, been sued, been prosecuted, won cases, lost cases, gotten free lodging in the prisons over the thing. He was always just filled with the greatest, wildest stories around. Well, anyway, he lands up being run off of Colfax about 1988 or so, and he decides he's going to relocate on Broadway. In about 1989, he gets a hold of the old Republic Drugstore building right here. And in no time, he lands up having this as chaotic, as crowded a bookstore of that. By this time, I'd connected with him, and I used to work here. And my job was basically sorting out the books out of that there, which I just found a fascinating, fascinating job. Because I would come across these titles and authors I'd never heard of that were in great demand, and it's always the challenge, especially in an informal bookstore like that, is exactly what title belongs in what place on this, but again, typical of what would happen is right near the front desk is where he had his Western History Colorado section, and I can remember one day I spent two, three hours cleaning out the mess as soon as I finally had the mess cleared out so I could browse there properly because I didn't get paid. I took in trade stock from this place. Lo and behold, he buys a couple, three boxes of books, and this is where he has the new pile, and in no time it's as big a mess as it was before I started over there of uh, that. But he hosts me. In fact, when my first book on South Denver comes out in 1991, this is where we have the opening of the book itself on that. And if I need to find out what's really going on with this, he had a partner named Frank Lester who used to be part of the small bone circle of the mafia in town of this. And it was just, again, the crazy people that would be coming in here in one form or another was marking this. And even though by this time, actually other book dealers had started to go and approach South Broadway. A guy named Pin Rose, about 1986, 1987, opens up a place called Fahrenheit's that was originally over about the alley of Broadway, Lincoln, on that, the year of that, moves around a couple locations, he sells that out. That's sort of the oldest surviving bookstore in town. It's off near Cedar and Broadway 
these days of this and meanwhile suddenly a wide variety of used bookstores are coming in here and how much you can really trust used bookstore people is very very open to debate <laughs> in fact quite an interesting novel about denver is by john dunning a former denver post reporter which is a murder mystery called bookman's wake about how crazy and criminal book dealers are along the way out of it itself of describing these people so they come and go, there's efforts at cooperative, collective stores, like down the place used to be something called the Denver Book Mall of a dozen or so different book dealers would share spaces and they decided to kick them out of there to turn it into a history bar or whatever. It survived as the Broadway Book Mall and there's another branch of it farther out on Antique Row these days of that. Well, meanwhile, Bill Good sells out again of his numerous premises and a very honest, very devout religious woman whose husband had made a fortune in Texas oil gets a hold of the bookstore. She cleans it up completely of this and decides it's going to be Ichabod's for the headless horseman of a Washington Irving fame or something like that. And again, it's cleaned up. It's still a very good, very quality bookstore of this until Tattered Cover is doing an inventory and it's finding that a lot of its inventory is missing. And suddenly the place where you can buy brand new books that cost half the suggested retail price you would pay at Tattered Cover are available at Ichabod's. And what had happened was a couple of the staffers down at Tattered Cover were systematically stealing the new stock at Tattered Cover coming down to Ichabod's and selling it here. And that's how Ichabod's was able to offer the books at such a discount of this. Eventually there's a lawsuit, arrest, prosecutions, and to get out of trouble, Ichabod's pays a settlement to Tattered Cover of about $500,000. Well, anyway, amidst all of this, Jack Jensen lands up coming on the scene and he gets this place in the early 20th first century or so when Jack's again something of an old beatnik, hipster, hippie, very good artist and he decides that this is going to be his combination bookstore, art gallery and he puts in a coffee bar as part of it itself on that and he decides that when there's any kind of problem and the authorities are after you, you're supposed to turn the guns on the authorities and mutiny now for the occasion. So the store becomes mutiny now amidst these activities itself. And then he sold the place about five years ago and they decided, well, if you don't want to read, you don't want to go to the coffee shop, but you want to hang out here, isn't this a good place to play pinball? And so it gets its current incarnation of being a mutiny today out of it. And meanwhile, it's just been amazing the transformation of the blocks over here where there's a lot of new construction, whether it's for better or for worse, is somewhat questionable. And typical of this is a place, again, a block down from here called the Punch Bowl. And the Punch Bowl used to be a bar owned by a boxer, Jack Dempsey who was actually a Colorado boy who, after being heavyweight champion, opens up a fancy sports bar in New York called the Punch Bowl because you drink punch in the Punch Bowl and you throw punches around out of it. And there was for years a local bar called the Punch Bowl over at about 20th Street and the Stout, Curtis, Champa, one of those places there had some beautiful murals inside of it itself on there and over what was anchoring the corner of First Avenue and Broadway where the punch bowl is today was a Miller's Groceria. And at one time Miller's was the foremost grocery chain in town. 
And they had an old store there, totally rebuilt, expanded in the 1960s. And right about the time Miller's totally expands, rebuilds, Miller's sells out to a yeah, Chicago outfit called Dell Farm. The place is never the same through the 70s, through the 80s. Chain after independent after chain comes and goes from the grocery spot out of there until it becomes a good schlock shop, something called Big Lots for a while out of it. And that never lasts out of that. And again, it took them a lot to try to put in the punch bowl as sort of the ultimate yuppie millennium hipster, whatever term you want to use place, many, many delays occurring in and out of this itself, but it just keeps going on and on. In fact, as I talk about this, I could probably write a book about all of this. In fact, I think I have written a book on all of this itself, and these are all my books. I just brought a sample tonight because the bookstore was supposed to have a stock on display, and I don't know where these are, but anyway, my book that really deals with the area over here is something called The Spirits of South Broadway. And what happens on this is my very first Denver book comes out in 1988, which is what, 30 years ago already? <laughs> uh, that itself on that, it was called Denver's Capitol Hill, about the Capitol Hill neighborhood. It did well. And I figured since I did this on Capitol Hill, where I used to work for a newspaper, I also for a while was working on something called the Washington Park Profile. Why not do a comparable book on the Washington Park South Broadway University Park neighborhood? And on that basis, something called De South Denver Saga lands up coming out in something like February 1991 of that. It was a problematic book. But it sold very, very well. And after about 10 years, it was out of print, and I get involved in other commitments, other things, until about 2007, when I finally have some time to start trying to revise as the book. And no sooner do I start trying to revise South Denver Saga than I come to the conclusion, this book is hopeless. It is far beyond any revision. It needs to be totally rewritten and expanded and rewritten and expanded. And the next thing I know is I have upwards of a thousand pages of that. And I decide why, instead of one overwhelming huge volume, maybe I should have three different volumes going and reflecting the three different parts of South Denver. There's the South Broadway corridor, there's the Washington Park area, and then there's the area south of the freeway, the University Park, Platt Park neighborhood as a whole. So the first part of it was the Spirits of South Broadway. And I thought I was going to jazz this book up by putting some ghost stories in there because my best-selling book of all is something called The Ghosts of Denver, Capital Kill. And it never quite worked. The sales were never quite what I was hoping for. And I don't know whether it's partly because of the cover or not. And the problem with the cover here is you look up above the marquee at the Mayan Theater, there is a Maya Indian staring down at you. And this is what my photographer decides is going to be far and away the best cover out of it. But if you don't know South Broadway, this looks like it's a book about the Maya Indians <laughs> rather than South Broadway itself. But this takes the story of Broadway, the Baker neighborhood down to Santa Fe, to the river, over to Overland Park, and some places goes east to South Pearl Street, the old Byers Junior High, things like that. This is uh, $20 this evening. Volume two on the effort is called The Haunts of Washington Park, which is the story, believe it or not, of Washington Park and why you're supposed to go jump in the lake over there and what happened when they had a swimming hole in there and ice skating and other things, as well as the surrounding neighborhoods, the Belcaro area, Bonnie Bray, 
Yeah, Corey Merrill, the Polo Club, things like that. This is also $20. Volume 3 comes out, which is the Ghosts of University Park, Platt Park, and Beyond. And no sooner have I put together my introduction about this haunted house owned by an old DU professor up at Evans and Milwaukee than a couple of book dealers buy the house and tear it down. So maybe they're properly haunted, but they have their store. It's called Gallagher's over at about uh, Louisiana and Broadway itself. But this also includes not just University Park. It talks a lot about the Platte Park neighborhood, the Harvard Gulch area, parts of South Broadway, adjacent neighborhoods, on and on. With that, as my <coughs> South Denver trilogy there, since then, I've been doing a lot of other neighborhood histories of that, like uh, before coming down to the bookstore tonight, I was over on the Art Walk at Santa Fe. And if I was trying to figure out what is this old church they have here that's called the Scum of the Earth down at Calumeth and West 11th Avenue, and I have to look at this book to say, oh, this was the third Congregationalist church that became a Seventh-day Adventist church that became a Spanish Methodist church that became this, that became that, on and on with this. But this has the story of Araria, places like that, West High School, on and on with it there, and I was going to present to the pastor of the scum of the earth who wasn't there this evening, uh, a book called, which is my favorite title, called DIA and Other Scams. And DIA and Other Scams is actually volume six of a six volume work on Denver from the Pikes Peak Gold Rush into the 21st century. And not only does this have the airport scams, it has library scams, it has our old friend Alan Reaver and savings and loan scams, in their waterworks scams, school busing scams, all sorts of things like that around. And I'm sure somehow the staff here is going to show you where the rest of my stock is. But with that said, are there any questions, comments, since I'm supposed to be out of here in 15 minutes? <laughs> yes? Do you have anything on East Denver? Okay, a couple of books on East Denver. Actually, three books on East Denver. Number one, My Ghosts of Capitol Hill is actually as much a comprehensive history of the area between Broadway and Colorado Boulevard from about First Avenue to City Park as it has anything to do on ghosts itself. Then I have a book out called Park Hill Promise that deals with the section east of City Park to the north of Colfax Avenue, stretching up to about Syracuse Street. My most recent volume that came out about a year ago is something called Magnificent Mayfair, Beautiful Belleville, Haunted Hill Top, things like that of sort of the area east of Colorado Boulevard to the south of Colfax of modern East Denver. Yeah. Jason? Um, well, first of all, I want to say thank you. I really appreciate you because I think we need more people that are trying to keep the history of live in Denver. So everyone should buy his books because we, we are literally lucky to have someone that spends the crazy amount of time that you've done researching all this stuff. Are there any other I paid him this. I bought it for lunch uh, a couple of months ago. <laughs> no, and I'm just a fan. That's why I can uh, film this stuff. If anyone wants to, I'll be on YouTube. But uh, do, you, do you know of any other historians that have looked into the history of Denver? And what are your thoughts on, on other historians, Denver historians? Okay. In the, okay, in the course of the 19th century, a couple of journalists try to do some comprehensive histories of town. There's something called Vickers History of the City of Denver that came out about 1880. Then Jerome Smiley writes a book, The History of Denver, about the city's first 40 years that came out about 1901. They were both essentially booster histories, i.e. what is good for business is defined as the community, virtually no attention to the kooks, the cranks, the workers, the women, blacks, the wrong kind of people, and actually in both cases they were books where you could get hired to be part of history. And what would happen is they were subscription books, 
and you could go and pay them to put your picture in the book, to write a biography of you as part of the book itself that sounds real, real venal and was real venal and I'm really glad they did it because when I'm trying to research some of these people, it's so much easier to go into one of these published volumes than have to go through all the old newspapers, dusty files, whatever on that itself. But again, no real critical vigor lands up happening in either of these books. The first really vigorous critic of Denver is a guy named uh, Clyde Henry, Clyde, Li Clyde Linden King, The History of the City of Denver in Relationship to Utility Corporations that comes out about 1910, 1915, which is actually a very, very good instrumental look at the politics of how Denver is run how you buy a utility franchise, how you uh, go and buy a city councilman, mayor, other <laughs> such things out of it. He soon goes to the Wharton School of Economics at the University of Pennsylvania. And then there is just this amazing gap in Denver history. In the late 1950s, Louisa Ward Arps, who is a librarian at East High School, does among the very first shows ever on Channel 6, which was then owned by Denver Public Schools called Yesterday's Denver. And she put them together in a very nice, very readable book called Denver in Slices. But again, no real critical vigor. Then the first really modern effort at any academic history of Denver comes out about 1977 written by Lyle Dorset, a professor at the University of Denver who doesn't really know Denver history, is on the take, gets corporate money, and has a very strong political agenda that the conservative status quo is holy, and otherwise there's a bunch of knockers and malcontents. They are a, quite a shallow book. Then about 10 years after that comes the current standard book on Denver, Mining Camp to Metropolis, that was written by Steve Leonard, the longtime chairman of the history department at Metro, along with Dr. Colorado. And Dr. Colorado is an outstanding public relations guy who knows very little about Denver, known as Tom Noel. Outstanding at selling himself, promoting himself, and usually getting somebody else to write his books for him <laughs> along the way out of it. It has a nice, cute overtone on occasion. On every controversial issue, it takes the status quo opinion. It never even presents that there are alternatives to the status quo, that there were different debates going on in terms of all of that. There have been a lot of little studies here and there, like among the very best books ever written on Denver was something called The First Hundred Years by Robert Perkin, who was a, Den a Rocky Mountain News reporter that writes the official history of the Rocky Mountain News in 1959. An amazingly good book. On another side, if you just want a good entertaining book, that's none too accurate, but it tells great, great stories, is by Gene Fowler called Timberline, which is filled with these outrageous stories of Denver of the early 20th century. Yeah. I'm wondering if you have any comments about the movement to rename Mount Evans. Well, John Evans is the second territorial governor of Colorado, and he was not shy. The town of Evans, Colorado is named for guess who? Actually, before coming to Denver, he was in Chicago and he decided what Chicago needed was a great Northwestern University. And where's a good town for a great Northwestern University? You not only have Evanston, Illinois, you have a railroad town right at the yeah, southwest corner of Wyoming, Evanston, Wyoming, is named for him itself. And actually, I think Mount Evans was originally called Mount Rosalie itself on that. And again, he's sort of the guy that 
fans the hysteria that makes the Sand Creek Massacre possible. He's bluster, boasting, whatever on that. And actually, you talk about Denver historians. His family hired Alan DuPont Breck, the longtime chairman of the DU History Department, to write three absolutely fawning, driveling, drooling books about the glories of the Evans family over the years out of that itself. But then why are you going to quit with him? There's so many scoundrels around here, like Robert Spear was a scoundrel. The whole history of Spear Boulevard has plenty of problems associated with it. David Moffat is an amazing scoundrel. Walter Scott Cheeseman, another absolute scoundrel. So once you get started on all of this, you might just totally transform the city. So since we don't name anything for anybody that really matters, any of the old uh, rabble rousers, uh, union activists, whatever, we might as well keep with the current scoundrels. Otherwise, I can just think of Hickenlooper Boulevard <laughs> of this itself. And, I keep telling people we ought to have the Elias Webb building rather than the Wellington Webb building because you go to the corner of Fourth Avenue and Acoma, there is a huge mansion there, and that's where a guy named Elias Webb lived, and he was a big politician 120 years ago and a city office holder because we all know that no mayor of Denver would ever be so vainglorious as to absolutely insist that the city break all of its rules and name something for him, would we? Anyway. Quick question with a quick answer. What's the real pronunciation of Zuna, Galapago, and Hamden? Okay, I have a book out called Denver Streets, Names, Numbers, Locations, Logic, and I deliberately did not touch on that subject there because there is no consensus on that itself. Again, you go down to New Mexico, it's the Zuni Indians itself, but Denver has tended to pronounce it Zuna. You go to the 2000 West Block, Denver tends to pronounce it Tejon. You go down to Colorado Springs, it is Tejon Street. Some of the locals that never liked having streets named for Indians decided it ought to be called T. John Street for the occasion. And is it Navajo or should it be Navajo Street or Navajo of that itself? On that, so again, uh, there's no consensus and there's no real way to prove this because Howard Maloney, who's the guy that sort of put together the alphabets naming it for this, he at one time was an Indian agent up in Montana and apparently he had a list of Indian tribes and all was putting them together of this but with no real consensus of that there. So, other comments, or now that the music is starting to come up, have you had enough for the <laughs> evening and now should go out to wild and wondrous Miracle Mile and see what miracles you can make this evening? Okay, thanks a lot. And I don't know whether I'm selling the books or the bookstore is selling the books tonight or whatever on that, or where the bookstore's books are. Okay. Always fun. Okay. <laughs>